support him, love him, and I believe God's got some great things in store for his body to do. And so, if you can, uh, and I hope you're there now, let me read today's word from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let us pray. Dear Holy Father, as we come before you today and study your word, uh, and just speak to us and speak through me and uh, allow everything that comes out of my mouth to be from the Holy Spirit and the Lord may be edifying and glorifying to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let me turn me down a little bit, bro. Um, I'm a little loud sometimes, so I just want to apologize for this in advance. I'm going to talk to you about the topic of salvation. It's one of the most actually, it is the most important thing we can talk about. And it is something that is so simple, yet so costly, yet the American church has twisted so greatly. And so I think we really need to understand what it means to be saved and what we were saved from this morning. So that's what I'm going to share with you from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And, and as I always do whenever I tell somebody that they're going to be in a story, I called yesterday and I actually uh, uh, forgot for a little bit that the story I want to share with you this morning, uh, Don Trickland was with me when this happened. When we were first starting to go off witnessing, and we got groups of people to come up, uh, we would be on Sunday night at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, and they would give us a sheet to go visit people. And usually it had on there uh, a name of somebody, maybe they needed some prayer, or maybe they were visitors to the church. So we had a little bit of headway about the person we were getting ready to go see. But on this particular evening, they only gave me a piece of paper with an address and a name. That's all I had. And I had not been out talking to people much. I had not been visiting people that often. And yet they had me as the leader with Dawn and three youth um, to go out with me that evening. And so I remember we go to a house at Long Meadow. And it's, it's dark. And, and I'm already nervous a little bit. But I get up to the house and the light is on. And it's shining on a form light that says, uh, God bless this house. And, and I know we want to be a people who are lost and everything. But when you have to been to somebody's house... That's a good sign for us, right? It's a friendly sign. God bless us. So we knock on the door, and the people answer the door, and we told them while we were there, and they said, we just got home from church. And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, we're doing great. And we get in, and they said, come on in. I said, this never happens. And then they tell me that they're actually pastor of a church. been pastoring a church here in Chester for 20 years. And I was like, this is awesome. And this will be a great learning experience for us to get our confidence up. And I almost took for granted um, while we were there. I think sometimes you can assume people are saved or, or assume uh, how they walk just by their attendance in church or the positions that they hold. And we never ask them to share the testimony. If you're a Christian, you should be overjoyed to share the testimony that Christ has done in your life. And so I'm sitting there, and as we're sitting there, I said, you know, I said, we're here today, and we got these students. Do you mind uh, saying to this pastor, if you just share with us your testimony on how you came to know the Lord? As you're seeing. And I want you to know that, that 20 years this person has been pastoring in Chester. And I don't even know the church. It doesn't, it doesn't matter as far as that goes. And I asked him, I said, tell me about your salvation story. And the pastor says, my parents forced me to be saved when I was six. And I literally just started to, I just couldn't even believe what I was hearing. So I said, well, I don't know that's when you went forward, but when... When were you saved? When did you turn your life over to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? It was, it was that day. It was that day I turned my life. And I was like, but you didn't want to go forward? No. You didn't know what you were doing? No. My parents told me I was saved that day, and that was going to be it. And this is the message that they've been proclaiming for 20 years to the church. 
in the league. And literally, one of the students, Kelsey Dayberry, who was with me, she fell out of her chair. I mean, she couldn't even believe what she was hearing. So, so without trying to embarrass this pastor, I said, you know, can, just for the benefit of the, the students that are here, can you tell us what you think it means to say why you are going to heaven? Why do you think you're going to heaven? And the pastor said to me, because I'm a good person and I do good things. And the Holy Spirit just came down on me and I was like, I was just so convicted and I started to share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ with this pastor. And I literally saw the Holy Spirit start convicting the pastor and the pastor realized that they were not even saved. See, the, I wish this was an anomaly. I wish this was something that, that was uh, once in a, in a little bit of time. But if you, the fact of the matter is, if you ask a hundred people who say they are Christians what it means to be saved, a lot of them will say that I'm saved because I do good things. I, I serve the Lord. I, I'm a good person. And I'm telling you, if you think that you're going to heaven because you were a good person, it will never measure up. It will never be enough. We are sinful people who have sinned against the holy and righteous God, and God cannot be around sin. There is nothing that we can ever do to earn or merit our own salvation. That's why we need Jesus. Amen. It is, it is by grace alone and faith alone in Christ alone that we are saved. See, if you think that you can do something enough to earn your salvation, then what we're effectively saying is that Jesus' death on the cross wasn't enough. But I'm telling you today that Jesus Christ plus nothing equals everything. He is all you need. He is the all-sufficient Savior. He is the one that you need to place your faith and trust in. And not in the things of this world. Not trying to impress other people. But humbly come before the Lord and say, I need you. Save me. Deliver me. And let me be used for your glory. Do I have a witness in here this morning? Or I brought my own that y'all aren't excited about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when we see what we are saved from, that we were spiritually dead, when you see Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, we realize that we were spiritually dead. It says, and you were dead. Now, I don't know if you know much about dead people, but dead people are dead. All right? I mean, that's, that's a novel concept this morning. See, dead people don't need um, a, a doctor. Dead people don't need to be resuscitated. Dead people need to be resurrected. Dead people need Jesus to be able to live again. And when you see in the scripture, it says you were dead. This was how you walked. This was the life that you were walking in. You were dead. And yet they're saying, when I'm sitting here breathing, they said, you don't get what I'm saying. You were spiritually dead. You were dead in your trespasses and your sins. And you didn't even know it. It says that this is the way in which you once walked. I think this is so important because it says it's following the course of this world. See, this world has gotten so twisted. Just in the last, I mean, you think about when this was written and how relevant this is today. Anybody that says the Bible is outdated is not understanding that this is the living, breathing Word of God. You sit here and look just in the last two worlds, in the last two years, what the world has said is normal today. What, what is accepted in the world? See, spiritually dead people don't even know what they're doing is sinning against God. They think they're right because they're conforming to the patterns of this world and not the patterns of the Word of God. It says you were dead in trespasses and sins. And yet, think about how many times, I don't know if we have Facebook users, I know the students use Snapchat, all the social media. Have you been upset by watching somebody just abuse and, and, and profane God on Facebook and social media? And then yet, we want to we get back at them, right? We want to say something to them. But I want you to understand, people who are spiritually dead are incapable of understanding what they're saying. So us as Christians, we cannot say anything to them to make them alive again. It's the Holy Spirit working in them. Matter of fact, I would encourage you to do exercise. I played a horrible joke on my daughter earlier today. When we were going to breakfast, I said, do you want to go to Chick-fil-A? She said, yeah. I said, just get it Sunday in the course. <laughs> but if you go across, she's still not happy about that. But if you go across from Chick-fil-A, there's a cemetery. I would just want you to yell at every gravestone. Yell at every gravestone. Everything that hurts you in your life, yell at every gravestone. While someone who doesn't know, you just try to yell at it and see if it makes them rise again. 
That's the same thing as us talking to people who don't know Jesus Christ. We want people to come to know Jesus Christ, but the fact of the matter is they're spiritually dead and they're incapable of coming to know Jesus Christ on their own. They just can't do it. They're spiritually dead. Understand that. It says, following the courses of this world, of the power of, of the prince of the power of this air. See, this is all energized by Satan. While Satan is not all powerful, he can't be in every place at one time. He has his angels that are going around and are drawing people away from, from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is how this disobedience is taking place. And it says this. It's at work in the sons of disobedience, the ones who don't know Jesus Christ, the ones who are bashing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This same thing in which they once lived is living now with people who don't know Jesus Christ. And I think this is so important to understand what verse 3 says. Because if you look at verse 2, it says, you were dead. Paul, the Apostle Paul is talking to those in Ephesus, in the church, who are starting to act like they were before they were saved. He is saying, look, you shouldn't act like this. But if you notice the transition here, in verse 1 it says that you were dead. But in verse 3 it says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Do you understand that not just some people were dead in their trespasses, all were dead in their trespasses. This is where we have all been in our life. And if you don't know much about the Apostle Paul, read his testimony. Read his testimony. This is somebody who thought what he was doing was right. He had no clue what he was doing was sinning against the holy and righteous God. He actually thought he was serving God by persecuting Christians and killing them and dragging them off to prison. This is the life that Paul once lived and says, look, I am no different than you. This is the life that I once lived. And so if you ever try to put yourself on a pedestal thinking that you are better than somebody else, I want you to know we are all equal at the foot of the cross. Regardless of what you have done or where you've been and where you've come from in your life, we all need a Savior. The only difference is the state of decay that we have in our lives. So somebody that's committed the worst of worst sins is still equal to what you consider a minor sin. Sin is sin against a holy and righteous God. And so we see this. We're carrying out the desires of our flesh. We were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind. In other words, we were enemies of God. Whether you like it or not, we were enemies of God. This was our life before Christ. This is our spiritual death. But I want you to know, my two favorite words in the Bible, but God. When you see this, it is so awesome. We go, but God, although we were spiritually dead, although we were incapable of saving ourselves, although we were incapable of understanding our sins, God, being rich in mercy because of the great love that He loved us. Do you see that? Although we deserved death, God loved us anyways. Romans 5 8 says, although we were still sinners, Christ died. This is the greatest form of love I can ever understand or comprehend. This is the God faith type of love. When you see 1 John 4, 8, it's not that love God, does not know God because God is love. God loves us so much that He would send His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. While we were spiritually dead, while we were turning our backs against God, He still loved us and sent His Son to die for us. Isn't this a wonderful truth, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ? There's not anywhere you can run that is out far of the grace of the arms of God that will pull you back in, regardless of what you have done in your life. Being rich in mercy because of His great love, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You understand that when you were saved, when you were born again, when you were made alive, that the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you and you have Christ living in you. Isn't that a wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And I love Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, when we really get to the point of it. It says, by grace through faith you have been saved. By grace through faith you have been saved. This is not of ourselves. This is a gift of God. See, the, the, see, I, I said it this, this week. See, religion is messy, but Jesus is awesome. 
See, we, we twist in so many denominations. What I'm trying to tell you is that you can earn your way to salvation. There's, there's denominations that say you go to purgatory. You'll spend a, a time in, 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 in um, hell before you go up to heaven. And yet, we look at the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not my opinion. This is the word of God. This is by, by the grace of God, through faith in him, you have been saved. It is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I love this, this, this passage when we see the truth of this. Since you were saved. See, when you trust in Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, that is done. The work of the cross has already been completed. You are saved. This is not something that you have to worry about losing your salvation. This is something you have to earn anymore. It says you were saved. And I hope you understand that those of y'all who, who are here today and you have friends that, that are thinking that they can't possibly be forgiven for the things that they've done, God's grace is sufficient to forgive whatever you've done in your life. You can just repent and trust in Him. You don't have to go through life worrying if you'll be in heaven one day. It says it's by God's grace through faith you can say it is a gift that He has given to you. He gave His Son so that you don't have to walk around worrying about where you will spend eternity. So we were spiritually dead. We were made spiritually alive in Christ. But we have been made spiritually alive for a purpose. When I see verse 10, I, I, I love this. It says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Look at the first sentence, uh, first part of verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship. In other words, we are his masterpiece. We have been made in the image of God. Isn't that awesome? When somebody tells me that I'm a piece of work, <laughs> I can say, you're right, I'm a part of his workmanship. God made me beautifully made and how he wants me to be, to be used for his glory and for his purpose. And he has made each of you for a purpose, for his glory. Not saved by works, you are saved to do good works for his glory. So that other people can see how gracious and how merciful of a God that we have. So walk in the grace of God. Walk in the mercy of God. Understand what you were before Christ. How he made you alive in Christ. And when you really understand what you've been saved from... It should make you want to go tell other people about the grace that you have been given. And so I pray this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, maybe you're one of those ones who have been sitting there and you've been holding on for, for whatever reason, thinking, now I need to do more in my life. I need to, need to serve more. I need to do these things in order to get to heaven one day. I want you to understand His grace is sufficient. You don't have to fight that fight anymore. You don't have to live underneath the bondage of sin anymore. He has already paid that price on the cross for you. So I pray that you understand that God loves you. You don't have to stop fighting. You don't have to keep fighting. You can turn your life over to Jesus Christ today. And maybe you have a loved one or a friend who is sitting there and they've heard things from different denominations. I just want you to open up the Bible to them, to Ephesians 2, 8-9, and let them know that God loves them, has saved them, and has a purpose for them. Would you do that today? Would you call somebody up who, who maybe has been hurt by religion, who, who maybe has been taught the wrong things? So just open up the Bible. And don't let them have your words. Just let them see the Word of God this morning. And I can tell you that lives will be changed because this Word changes lives. It's changed my life. It has changed many of your lives. So I want to pray for you this morning. And if you, if you have any needs in your life, if you have something that you need prayer for, it would be my honor to pray with you this morning. This is what a time of invitation is for. The time of invitation is for you to come forth and maybe you just need to pray where you're at, but I would be honored to pray with you this morning for anything that you've got going on in your life. This is what a church should be about, coming together to, as a group of believers who want to celebrate what God is doing in their lives, come before them and petition God for what we need in our lives. So when you do that, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm going to ask you to come forward and pray with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. I thank you for your grace that saved us. Your mercy that saved us, Lord. Lord, we are sinners. We need to save us. And Lord, we thank you for being that Savior. Lord, as I talked about last week in the reproductive work of Christ, 
Lord, that was only possible because of the redemptive work of Christ through the cross. And so, Lord, maybe someone here today came in here thinking that they needed to be here today in attendance simply to save them. I want them to understand that your grace is sufficient. You love them. You save them for a purpose. And Lord, may they walk out of here knowing that they are your workmanship. They are your masterpiece. If you love the earth. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and respond to the word of God.